All right, so I wasn't able to be with you tonight, and um, but just wanted to make a short recording. It's Fat Wednesday, which means it's the last Wednesday before Ash Wednesday next week. And um, <laughs> my sister-in-law, she loves to celebrate feast days, and so I'm pretty sure she's celebrating Fat Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And then we'll start the great fast on Ash Wednesday. And and so I just want to like offer a few reflections and, and kind of give a give some direction as we prepare for Lent. And um, and so so of course like you guys in my high school group, you're my primary audience, but I'm gonna share this with the rest of the parish as well because sometimes Lent sneaks up on us and, and it really is one of the most important seasons of the liturgical year. So let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space and ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us to bind us to our Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and work of ours may begin with you, and through you be happily completed through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so so as we're beginning, there's a, there's a little bit of review of things that you probably already know, and uh, and hopefully, you know, nobody's fallen asleep yet, and everybody's got enough snacks, right? Like, we, you know who you are. Um, so Lent is 40 days, right? And, and we asked the question, okay, so why is Lent 40 days? And what is it about that? And the year 40 or the number 40 in scripture, it always refers to a time of getting ready for something new, right? A time of preparing for something new. And so, so the first place it shows up is with the flood and, and the Lord had looked on the earth and man had become incredibly sinful and um we just had this reading at daily mass the other day and, and it speaks of how god is sort of like i need a do-over right like i'm gonna destroy everything and then noah finds favor with god and so the so god the lord he says to noah i'm like, gonna build me an ark <laughs> and then i'm gonna send rain upon the earth for 40 days and so noah builds the ark right he saves seven pairs of every clean animal one of every unclean animal that's something that always struck me when i was young um because that means there's always seven times as much good as bad right that that as bad as we find our lives you know and and the one thing that we think is like wrong with our life there's probably seven blessings right there's probably seven blessings and and it might be an interesting spiritual practice for when we find ourselves down or, or we feel like uh nobody understands me or um you know like financially things are a train wreck or this one aspect of my marriage is bad or my family life is bad but then there's seven to remember to have seven blessings and and to express gratitude for seven things in your life and um and we might find that what happens when we do that is, is our heart starts to change and we realize, okay, I, I, there's something more than, you know, just this sort of, this sort of one problem that, um, that I have right now. Another 40, uh, year number in scripture is 40 years that the Israelites wandered in the desert. And so, so our Lord delivers the people from slavery in Egypt and, and they'd been crying out to the Lord when they were enslaved. And the Lord hears their cry, right? The Lord hears their cry and he answers them. And so he sends Moses to Pharaoh to ask that the people might go and worship their God in the desert and worship their God on the mountain. And, and so they go to that mountain. And um, But on the way, like Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And so he sort of regrets letting them go and he says he sends his army after them right we all know the story and and moses and the israelites cross the red sea god parts the red sea and then he causes it to crash in on pharaoh you know like when mary proclaims the magnificat she says you have cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowlier 
You have filled the hungry with good things, and the rich you have sent away empty. You have shown the strength of your arm. You have scattered the proud in their conceit. And and it is that moment of crossing the Red Sea that, that the Lord shows the strength of his arm. And he scatters the proud in their conceit. But, but that's not the end, because even though they had been delivered, they get to Mount Sinai. Moses goes up to speak to God and then the people start worshiping a golden calf right like immediately the people become unfaithful and and then the Lord kind of leads them to wander in the desert for 40 years sometimes like I've heard it said right that was to purify the people so that no one who had worshiped the golden calf would actually enter the promised land and um and it's also a time of preparing their hearts, right? It's a time of preparing them for like the gift that God wanted to give to them, right? Because he wants them to receive it well. And, and we have to get all the sin out of our life in order to receive it well. Like that last bit of sin that we're carrying around in us, we have to get it out in, in order to in order to encounter, encounter the love of, of our Lord. There's 40 days of preparation that take place after Jesus rises from the dead. And so, so the apostles find themselves in, the, in really a similar place as the rest of the Israelites. You know, they, they've been walking with our Lord for three years. They, they had gone out two by two. They had cast out demons in his name. They cured the sick in his name. The bread and the fish, the loaves and the fish is multiplied in their own hands. And even though they had seen all of these wonders and they'd seen all those things and they looked at our Lord in the face and, and our Lord touched them when the time came that he was handed over to die, most of them, 11 out of 12, weren't present, right? Only the beloved disciple, only John was there when our Lord died. And so, so there's hope in that. When we tell that story, we should find hope in that because that means insofar as, as I've made resolutions in the past to be faithful and then become unfaithful or I don't follow through or, or I have a difficult time, you know, keeping up with my prayers, <laughs> I have company. And, and those who are closest to our Lord were also, they also struggled with the same thing. And then after the resurrection, our Lord remains with them for about 40 days before the ascension, before he goes to be with the Father. And, and that time of 40 days was sort of a time of them being in a greater school of love, right? In a, in a greater school with our Lord. And, and it was a time of preparing them for their mission to go out into the world and proclaim the gospel to all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And, and so, so this, this 40 days is always preparing for the next thing, right? Preparing for something new and, and pre preparing for our lives to be different. You know, that's, that's what it was when Noah was in the ark. It was what it was when the Israelites were in the desert. It, it's what it was for the apostles before Jesus left them and ascended into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And, and so we might ask ourselves, what are we preparing for? So, so in a very direct way, every year we celebrate the season, this 40 days of preparation. And in the tradition of this 40 day fast, it, it began with catechumens. It began with those who were preparing for entry into the church. Those who, who maybe weren't, Christian, they live, were living pagan lives. They might have been living really sinful lives. And then, and then they, were, they heard the gospel proclaimed and they realized like, okay, there's something I want there. And, and I want to have this, this abundant life that I'm hearing about. Like I want to have joy and, and I, want the, I want more, you know, I want more for my life. And, and that's something you've heard me say on Sundays a lot, right? Like I want more and there's a desire for more. And so, <clears throat> so those who were entering into the church, they would fast for 40 days in order to prepare themselves to receive the sacrament of baptism. And so in our own parish, we have at 
the Easter Vigil this coming year, at least, right, at least um, three young people receiving confirmation, one young person who will receive his first communion. Um, we've got, and then we're praying for a couple of others, right? We're praying for a couple of others. And, um, and so for, for those of you, like those of you young people who are preparing for confirmation at the Easter Vigil, this is a very specific time of preparation. It's a specific time of preparing our hearts. It's a specific time of, of fasting in order to, to get ready for, for the reception of the Holy Spirit in that sacrament. And the rest of us are all fasting and praying for you, right? So during the season of Lent, we, we pray especially for the catechumens. We pray especially for those who will enter the church at Easter. And all of our sacrifices and sufferings are meant to be offered up for, for those among us who will, who will become new members of the church. And, and it's also a time in which at the Easter Vigil, at the Easter Masses, each and every one of us can remember back to our own entry into the church. And we renew the commitment we made to live our lives. And, and so when we renew our baptismal promises, we were asked these three questions. And, and so these three questions can become a sort of format or they, they become a, a pathway to discerning what is my prayer fasting and almsgiving going to look like and and all of us will answer i do to these questions and and the goal is that our i do means i do right our i do means i do our i do doesn't mean i guess right it doesn't mean i guess you can imagine like if there was a married couple at their wedding and you know, do you promise to be true to her in good times and in bad and sickness and in hell till death do you part? I guess so. Like, ugh, ugh, like leave the altar right now if that happens. And and so your I do has to mean I do. And and to be a firm resolve, right? It should be a firm resolve. And, and to realize also that it's possible to say I do to these questions. And, and so... We're preparing to say, you know, we reject Satan, we reject all his works, we reject all his empty show, all his empty promises, and we believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And to believe in Jesus Christ means I believe that he <laughs> is the one who gave his life so I can live. I believe that he is the one that has the ability to bring unity where there's division, that he can bring unity to my own heart, that he can transform my life. And all is empty show. I, I reject all of the lies I start to believe. I, I, I reject the lie that everybody's against me. I reject the lie that I have to get through life on my own. I reject the lie that people are untrustworthy. I reject the lie that God loves everybody in the world except for me. I reject the lie that God only loves me because he has to love me and there's nothing unique, exclusive, or unrepeatable about his love for me. Like, I reject all of that because I don't want any sin left in my heart, right? I don't want any sin left in my heart. And, and for those of you who struggle with perfectionism, understand, right? Progress, right? Progress, progress. Striving. Sarah Swafford always was like, she gives talks to women and she's like, ladies, repeat after me, striving, 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 right? And, and so sometimes when people are in addiction recovery, they, they say progress, not perfection, right? Like I can't focus on being perfect. I have to focus on progress that, that I have my whole life to be holy, to get holy. We want to do it as soon as possible. Like we want to speed it along, but it all works in our Lord's own time. And, and we do, he's merciful and he waits and, and we have our whole life, but, but we don't want to intentionally put it off. We don't want to intentionally put it off. And, um, and so, so these three questions is what we're preparing for. We're, we're preparing to be able to give a very firm and solid and resounding answer 
to those questions when they're asked at Easter. So how might we prepare for that renewal? We These are the three things that we always do during Lent. We we prepare through prayer, through fasting, and through almsgiving. And, and so prayer, like, is this friendship with God. Like, prayer is about friendship with God. It's about friendship with God. You know, it's not about knocking it out. It's not about checking things off of our list. It's about friendship with God. So we might have a list that helps us to be friends with God, but it has to be about friendship with him and friendship with the Lord and sharing our hearts with the Lord and and really like coming to know him in a deeper way. And the purpose of fasting is is to set aside the things that get in the way, right? To set aside the things that get in the way. You know, and if if I find myself whenever I'm in distress seeking refuge or comfort or like I'd rather eat 15 cookies than than share my heart with people um or I'd rather I zone out on Netflix, then then I'll go and like spend time with our Lord. And if I've got a problem, and uh, and I'm not taking it to our Lord, right? So fasting is about saying no to the things that get in the way. Saying no to the things that get in the way. Fasting is not simply about fasting for fasting's sake or suffering for suffering's sake. It's it's a tool to help us to get every bit of sin out of our life so that we can be friends with God. And almsgiving is is that way of being generous and and giving of ourselves and and finding that path of service, right? And so so there is this kind of progression, right? Prayer and fasting are really about me and the Lord. And and as that space between me and our Lord opens up and, and I grow in union with him, then I'm freer to go and be generous with others. And in one form of alms, of almsgiving we're doing and, and CCD is uh, supporting the food pantry right now. And so like your donations to the food pantry are a way of being generous with the Lord, right? And being generous with the poor and, and making a gift so that, <laughs> making a gift being a gift to others so that maybe that other person realizes, oh, there's something real about those Christian people. You know, those Christian people, they actually do love me. And they live their lives differently. And I want to be part of that, right? I want to be part of that. That's the goal, right? That's the goal. And, uh, and so what specifically should we do? Like, how do we decide what do I do for Lent? Like, what does my prayer, fasting, and almsgiving look like? What's it going to look like? And and that really is something that's unique to each person. And and it's it's we have to take some to step back and ask ourselves, okay, like what what is the thing that need, that getting in the way? And so John fifteen is where Jesus talks about the vine and the branches, and he says, "I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower." He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and every one that does, he prunes so that it bears more fruit. <laughs> you are already pruned because of the word that I spoke to you. And so, so he's telling his disciples that they're already going to bear fruit because of the word that he spoke to them. And, and they maybe even are currently bearing fruit because they've been pruned. But the important thing for them, and this is what we should receive, all of us who are already in the church, who are already confirmed, who are already professed to be Catholic Christians, we have to remember these words when he says, remain in me as I remain in you. Right? Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you. Unless you remain in me, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, because without me you can do nothing. And anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither. People will gather them and throw them into a fire, and they will be burned. 
And, and so our Lord uses that image of the vine and the branches and, and that the branch bears fruit as long as it remains on the vine. If we cut the branch off the vine, it's just going to like dry out and rot. And the thing that keeps it alive, right, is the sap, right? Like the sap flows from the vine into the branch. And, and the more, and so, so the, the fruit of the branch, right? Like our own lives are fruitful as long as the sap is flowing into us and and the sap we might consider is the holy spirit right the, and as long as the spirit is active in us we start to we bear fruit and and so so i stole this from catechesis the good shepherd right like the the question is the question is what keeps your sap from flowing you know what what where does the sap get stopped up? Where is it? What keeps it from flowing from the vine into you? And and where does it get stuck or slowed down? And how can we increase its flow? Right? How can how can we make more space for the spirit to come into our hearts, and and really change our lives so that we more naturally do the good? Right? We more naturally love others. We. We don't have fear, worry, anxiety, desire to control people, desire to tell everybody how holy we are because we don't need to because it's obvious in the way we conduct our lives. And um, and so, so that's the question, like what keeps your sap from flowing? And <clears throat> and so so that's the question that I want to leave all of you with this week as as we prepare to enter into Lent and, and we're kind of spending this week discerning what do I want to do this Lent like like what is the Lord first and foremost what does the Lord want to do in your life and and so I'm just going to give you some time to journal a little bit and um, and so using the baptismal promises. Just ask you to journal right now, like what are the things that are holding you back? What are the things that slow down your sap, right? And so what are the sins in your life that keep your sap from flowing? And there might be any of the generalized deadly sins. It might be pride. It might be gluttony. It might be lust. It might be avarice or the love of money or things or possessions. It might be like seeking after popularity. It might be sloth. I'm just lazy. It might be like, like any of those things, right? Like what are the sins in your life that keep your sap from flowing? And sometimes... Sometimes it's obvious because we're stuck in like things that are very obviously sins. Sometimes it's not so obvious because because sins like pride, um, oh, like sins like pride are so much harder to discern when they're present than like other sins. Like it's very obvious, you know. Like if somebody got struggles with drunkenness and they they end up getting sick the next day, well, it's obvious that you committed that sin, right? Um, Pride is like so much more subtle. And and so, so just like take some time. Like what are the sins that keep your sap from flowing? The second question is um, like what are the resentments, unforgiveness, or hurts that have atrophied your trust muscle? So, so I reject Satan. That's all the sins. I reject all his works, all the sins that have been committed against me. So, so like where do I have resentment? Where have I been hurt by somebody and I'm carrying around unresent? resentment or, or I'm, I'm waiting for forgiveness I'm withholding forgiveness um, I spend time having giving speeches in my head to certain people um, somebody has just been really untrustworthy in my life and and so I really don't want to trust people and, and and that's a hurt that impacts us because if if somebody that's very close to us has hurt us it, it becomes very difficult to trust again you know, it becomes very difficult to trust again and 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 I I have had those people in my life and it's not even they they didn't will it it wasn't their fault um I put way on way more on them than than they than they even knew you know and uh there are certain people especially when I was in high school that became kind of second parents to me and I don't I don't think they really had any idea that they had become second parents to me and how important that was to me. And, and I'm so grateful. Um, but there came a time when I was in college that I, 
I sort of tried to reach out to them and they were kind of like, uh, why are you reaching out to me? Like, I'm not in your life anymore. And I kind of felt like, oh, I don't have anybody, you know? And, and it was just like, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to trust again. I don't know if that's example's clear or not, but it's, uh, it's just things that happen in our life and, and then it becomes hard to trust. And the translation of that is it becomes hard to trust God. It becomes hard to trust God. So what are the resentments, unforgiveness or hurts? that have atrophied your trust muscle. Uh, what are the lies or unhealthy thought patterns that trouble you? And so do you reject all this empty show? Um, so, so like, what are some things that you know are, are kind of distorted and get in the way? Things like God doesn't really love me. I don't really, you know, believe I'm worthy of love. I think I'm just like, you know, a member of the crowd. I'm not really special. Um, I don't have gifts. <laughs> Like any of those things, those are just lies. They're just junk, and uh, and they need to they need to go. And then, so so as you kind of identify that, like those are the things that slow your sap down. Those are the things that get in the way. Those so those are the things, right? That we really want to um, <laughs> remove from our life. This line, like those are the areas of focus, right? Those are the areas of focus, and and so so then during the week. Um, I just invite you to uh, to consider what prayer, fasting, or almsgiving might might you take on in order to renounce the things on your list, in order to 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 sort of remove those things from your list, in order to heal the things on your list. Um, kind of something our Lord put on my heart. Like uh, I've preached on this a couple times. Is just um, it's been a lot of forgiveness in my heart and. Uh, and this year, Lord's like, it can't just stay in your heart. You have to tell people. <laughs> you have to actually like forgive people for things that have hurt you, and um, and that's a whole journey, right? That's a whole journey, and uh, and so like extending forgiveness where forgiveness needs to be extended. Um, that's an alms giving, right? It's an alms giving, and because it's giving somebody a gift and, and it might even be giving somebody a gift that we don't feel like they deserve but it's 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 probably more powerful arm alms giving than any um you know i also like maybe i just notice that i eat my emotions too much and and i need to give up my favorite snacks so um so we're going to give up snacks and uh and at ccd on wednesdays we probably will like change snacks you know uh, maybe we'll just have healthy vegan snacks or something. And uh, so um, so what what are the things? What's the best remedy? And, and maybe you can reflect on that. And, uh, and if anybody has like kind of questions about that, you know, I don't expect you to, to share with the world the things that were on your, you know, previous list on this list. But, um, but we might share about like, okay, what are the prayer, fasting and almsgiving that we want to take on? And and in our own like small group, our high school group, um, we might talk about, you know, what um, what's a communal kind of prayer, fasting or almsgiving that you want to do together? Or is is there some prayer that you want to commit to praying like for each other? And and that can be something simple like like we're all gonna pray on our Father every day for each other, or like I'm gonna remember like what everybody prayed for at the end of group and i'm gonna add i'm gonna pray for them every day for that you know so we're all gonna pray for um like the jacob's aunt or we're all gonna pray for like this kind of you know other thing that that came up for somebody else and and um it's also just a way of, of growing love for one another um so that's that's all I've got for this week, and uh, so I'm gonna leave it to you. Enjoy the rest of your fat Wednesday. Um, there's ice cream in my fridge in the basement for those of you who are meeting in my house right now, and um, so I'm keeping you in my prayers, and please keep me in yours as I uh, I'm giving a bunch of presentations in Lansing the next few days. So, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord Jesus, we just ask the grace to 
to have true self-knowledge and to grow in virtue during this Lenten season. Prepare our hearts during this time of, of preparation and retreat. We pray especially for all those who are preparing for confirmation that that this will be a time of growth and, and openness to your grace and, and that your grace may, may truly take root in all of their hearts. Renew in each of us the resolve to get every bit of sin out of our life, everything that slows down our sap. That, that we may glorify you in the way that we live and, and that the way we live will reveal the grace, the love, the mercy, the healing that, that comes from you alone. And through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and all the saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.